Today's lecture is on viruses and prions. So viruses are submicroscopic and we call them infectious agents and virology is the study of viruses. Now we're going to be focusing on bacteriophages and those are viruses that infect bacteria and animal viruses that are viruses that infect animals and humans. So a virion is a single infectious virus particle and they can have genetic material DNA or RNA but they don't have both and they're protected by a protein capsid. So again a capsid is a protein shell that packages and protects the genome. So if we take a look at this bacteriophage, and again a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria, uh, and it's pretty complex. This outer capsid here on the outside is made of protein, and we call those capsomeres, but it's protein. Inside you actually have the DNA or the RNA of the virus. Now viruses can also have a lipid on the outside, so we would call those envelope viruses, and in that case that's going to surround uh, that protein, and that arises when there's budding from the host cell, and uh, the virus takes along a little bit of cell membrane with them. Now a naked virus does not have the envelope, so that's the difference. Envelope, do you have that lipid on the outside? Naked, do not. Now, when we look at bacteria uh, phage, a lot of times uh, they will lyse their host cells, therefore they're always naked. They don't have that membrane on the outside. Now, please know, many viruses have spikes uh, that may protrude from the viral capsid. So, in this example here of an adenovirus, those little lollipop looking structures are actually the spikes that you see on the outside. This is an example of a herpes virus, same kind of thing. And even Ebola is going to have some types of spikes on the outside. So one of the things that researchers are looking at now with COVID is what type of spikes they have and can we make some type of a vaccine uh, from the knowledge that we have of those spikes. So influenza viruses have uh, what are called HA and NA spikes, and here's a good example of that here. Now viruses don't have a lot of genes. Uh, they have genes that encode the proteins, enzymes, and other structural factors that they need. And again, their genome can be RNA or DNA, single or double-stranded, uh, sometimes single, single or segmented, circular or linear. Now, two things to be aware of is that uh, viruses can undergo what is known as antigenic drift and antigenic shift. So that's why from year to year uh, you have to get a new flu shot. So our host immune system, our system, will recognize the HA and NA spikes. So if they change from year to year, we have to make new antibodies against that. So again, please know this, that influenza's RNA genome mutates frequently, causing minor changes to HA and NA. That's called antigenic drift. So again, antigenic drift would be when the influenza RNA genome mutates frequently, causing minor changes to N, A, and H, A. Now sometimes we have a major genetic shift and please know that that's called antigenic uh, shift. So if you have a real major genetic change, it's antigenic uh, shift. So here's an example, guys, where you could actually take two different types of viruses, for instance, the human flu virus and a uh, bird flu virus, and let's say uh, we have our little incubator here, little pig there, and what can happen inside would be that you get a new virulent strain as a result because you get recombination. So look at the different colors here, guys. So you've got some of the human RNA, uh, some of the 
bird virus RNA on the inside, on the outside, you wind up having some of the spikes from the bird and also from the human. So it's very hard to de devise a vaccine against that. So with the antigenic shift then, it can lead to an increased infectivity or expanded uh, host range. And I think you guys all know the term pandemic now. We're undergoing a COVID pandemic at the moment, which means that it can be worldwide. Now for bacteriophage replication, they can have what's called a lytic uh, replication pathway. And in that case, uh, the virus kills the bacteria that they infect. So please know these steps. The bacteriophage will attach to a bacterial cell wall. Then it's going to penetrate by injecting its genetic material into the cell. Once the genetic material is inside, there's synthesis that takes place and you make more RNA or DNA and proteins then eventually you reassemble or you assemble the virus and finally the virus is going to break out of the bacteria. So that's your release step. And this is just a picture of what goes on. Again, it attaches, injects its genetic material, starts to make more of itself, puts itself back together, and then the viruses are released. Now there's another uh, pathway that uh, the viruses can go through and that's called a uh, lysogeny phase where they will, instead of making more of themselves like normal, they insert their DNA into the bacteria's DNA, replicate, and then kind of come back out of that. So that's called lysogeny. You also need to know about animal virus replication. Now, if you look, we have one extra step, and that's the uncoding step here that we didn't have uh, when we talked about animal vir or the bacteria viruses. So again, for animal virus replication, you have attachment, penetration, uncoding, replication, assembly, and release. So when we go through this, guys, for attachment, the virus attaches to the cell membrane. Penetration will occur by endocytosis. For the uncoating step, you break down the capsid that's on the outside of the virus. Replication then, you're making more spike proteins, genome, capsid proteins. Then assembly, you put the viruses back together. Now, for the release, if you have a enveloped or an enveloped virus, it will be released by budding. Again, enveloped viruses are released by budding. Naked viruses are released by lysis. Naked viruses are released by lysis. Now, Oncogenic viruses can cause about 10 to 15% of cancers, and two examples are HPV and HTLV. So it's interesting to note then that if you don't get an infection with these viruses or be exposed to these viruses, you won't get the types of cancers that they can cause. Now, virus detection methods uh, vary and usually we utilize purified antibodies to bind to viral antigens. So please take a screenshot of this slide, guys. So right now what's going on out there when we're doing the testing for COVID is we are looking to see a couple of things. Uh, if the patient is infected, then they should be producing antibodies uh, against the virus. Now, we can also take purified antibodies and put them on a latex bead and look for the actual viral antigen. And agglutinate just means to clump, so they will come together. That would be your positive result then for this test. And again, if you take a look here, guys, uh, this is a negative test. See how nice and smooth that is? But you see how grainy that looks? All of those little... Um, 
beads clump together because the patient is positive for the viral infection. And we have another way, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. We'll talk about that later on in the semester. But again, this is a method right now being used to detect the antibodies against COVID uh, out there, as well as HIV, rabies, and a lot of other applications. So it's a great uh, tool to use. Now again, uh, we can also do nucleic acid testing. That's done a lot for uh, HIV in particular. So that's another way you can detect uh, viral uh, nucleic acid. And we'll talk about some of these methods later in the semester. And the last thing I'd really like you to know from this chapter, guys, are prions. They are infectious proteins. Some of you may have heard of mad cow disease. This is one of the cause, or the cause of mad cow disease.